If you enjoy these ship chats, then consider becoming a member at the Centurion tier, where you'll get access to all the exclusive artwork that I create increasingly for my videos, as well as exclusive mobile phone wallpapers. Right, today we're looking at the Steam Runner class. Its behind the scenes explanation is really quite simple. It was a first contact ship designed by Alex Yeager. Uh, apparently for the name he was inspired by the band Fold Zandura. Never heard of them, but okay, he's obviously a bit of a fan. He apparently wanted a more locomotive design, a more automotive design. The Steam Runner actually went through the most iterations of concept art before he landed on one that he liked. So that's quite interesting because the other proposals are quite interesting. But this one is certainly unique and uh, different. Although I do quite like the one which has basically it's the same setup. But the deflector dish module is on top. So it has that kind of lean back design. Almost like a, like a rocket car kind of thing. Very, very... Um, retro in that respect. Uh, the model was then built by uh, Larry Tan and Paul Thoren. The same model was then reused but uh, re-rendered in Lightwave 3D for uh, obviously Deep Space Nine. It then apparently also appears in Stormfront Part 2 in that fleet at the end. Can't say I ever noticed it but okay. Uh, and then it was re-rendered for its appearance in Eagle Moss which is the one we currently have uh, today. Now, I'll just get out two issues I kind of have with the design. One is personal. The personal issue is the... So, like I say, I really liked it when they had the basically dorsal mounting of the deflected dish, and it sweeps back like a, like a rocket car. Very retro, very cool. But that's not what they went with. They obviously went with the other design, with it sort of hanging underneath like a gondola. Which is fine, I don't mind that so much, but they keep the sweep. So the, the pylons sweep backwards. And it doesn't really flow with the shape. It just kind of drags the ship's profile out unnecessarily, frankly. There's no need to. It's, it's a little thing, but it just feels a little bit inefficient. I would have much preferred to have seen a... a, a delta sweep, you know, so a obtuse angle in the uh, pylons, between the pylons and the nacelles that connect to them, uh, we would instead, if it was swept forward, have a acute angle. And I think that would work much better. I think it's just it's just a little different, but I, I feel like it, it would help with the design and just because some people, a lot of people do say it's a bit of an odd design. And I think just a little change like that, changing the angles, does help. So that's the first half. The other half is also, there's a little bit of uncertainty as to where the warp core is. It's either in the primary hull, or it's back in the, uh, basically the deflector dish section, and you, much like some other ships, you have to go through the nacelles in order to get to it. Now, I don't hate this colossally, because I can definitely see you putting like a, you know, turbo lift section just kind of on top of themselves. Bear in mind, the nacelles are in armoured housings anyway, so there's enough additional space there to put a transit system. It would be a bit efficient, but you are going to get uh, extra safety. The deflector dish is a very sensitive piece of equipment and can be uh, easily damaged, and again, it does need power straight from the core. So I am, um, I probably, I probably would lean to the reactor being located back there, where it's separate to the rest of the ship, and where you know, even if it does get blown up, even if they do lose containment, you've got enough safety systems involved to preserve the rest of the ship. Now that basically brings us to the in-universe uh, vessel. So. It was designed as an anti-Borg ship, and that is really the underpinning uh, philosophy behind its design. It is, you know, everything's broken up, sort of separated, compartmentalized, uh, additional safety features, you know, because they know that you're going to get those Borg cutting beams, and they're going to try and cut you open and uh, break up your ship. And by having a more compartmentalized design you prevent them from doing catastrophic damage because they can just you know once the shields are down the ball can just straight laser your warp core and it's bye bye the boys so that's one aspect 
You also have the fact that it is built as a close-range brawler. So while other ships like the Akira and Norway are hanging at long range and bombarding the cube from afar, this is getting right up and close and really basically drawing the attention of the cube. And this is intentional, much like the Defiant. They're there to draw the attention of the cube and keep it, you know, running in circles trying to track to beam them. Um, now, obviously, it's much larger and heavier than the Defiant. This is essentially a heavy frigate in terms of its role in its anti-boar capacity, it's very similar. And of course, in service of that, much like the Defiant, which had very heavy ablative armor, which was possible because the Defiant is a small ship, this also has a very heavy ablative armor. It also has similarly embedded nacelles underneath protective armor layer. This is a very, very heavily armored ship. It is very difficult to break through. Energy weapons, that includes boar cutting beams, they're gonna struggle very tough now it is very tough but on the other hand it is comparatively lightly armored i suppose not when you take into account that it is only a frigate and not a cruiser um as it is often mischaracterized it only has six phases and they're quite small strips and two photon torpedo launchers at the front it's quite a modest armament but that belies what it's really there to do while it's only a handful of firing points the goal of the steam runner is not to win fights, it's to keep going through a fight, it's to hang in the fight, it's to draw it out, make it last longer, distract the enemy, sucker them in. And that's what the steam runner can really do. It has additional capacitors for its phaser for its phaser banks, and it also has an uh, a far larger torpedo magazine than normal, so it means it can keep fighting after most ships just exhaust their ammunition supply, which is quite handy. So it can get into a fight and really hang in there longer. And that's really where its Dominion War role comes in. So, you know, it's a little bit different, but still mu very much the same thing. It's designed in the Dominion War. It was used to just go right into the, into the thickest part of the fighting. You know, be that to grind forward an advantage, to grind the enemy down, or to cover a retreat, basically act as a giant shield the steam runner could do it uh it was really tough especially against like cardassian cruisers the cardassians hated this it was smaller but it could easily match a, ga a galore uh in a broadside exchange uh and even packs of these would be pretty difficult opponents for a jemhadar battle cruiser they'd you know much prefer to go around them because they're just these rock solid wedges of armor i mean that that does bring into another uh, another point, which is, as I say, heavily armoured. Another thing that this ship can do, much like the Defiant, is ramming speed. That is an option. It wasn't that commonly used, but it was an option. And you can see that expressed in the fact that you have that sort of cut out at the front of the main hull. There's that. As I say, with that compartmentalised design, what that also means is that even if it takes critical damage, even if you penetrate the shield, penetrate the armour, and, you know, knock out the warp core, even blow it up, well, it's well armoured enough that it can keep going, hang in that fight for even longer. So it's very difficult to take down. If you're facing an enemy that just wants to blow past you, that's going to be really frustrating for them. It's not going to be fun, and that is what the Dominion and Cardassians really relied on. So it was very successful during the Dominion War. It was a very rock-solid uh, platform for the Federation fleets. It also saw use post-war, interestingly enough, um, even though it was pretty much built as a warship. It saw, you know, its typical uses, you know, running here and there, doing border patrol, that kind of thing. But it also had a more unique role. And this was basically on account of its ablative armor. And that was in rescue, uh, rapid response and rescue situations. If a Nova class got in a little bit over its head, it got stuck in a gas giant or was falling into the corona of a star, then the best ship for the job was going to be a steam runner. Something that can go into very hazardous environments very hazardous situations and can just tank the damage no problem and that is something that the steam runner excelled at and so it was a very very handy uh emergency response vessel in those post-war years 
even when it wasn't fighting. It was uh, it was definitely still doing its bit and putting itself in danger and uh, putting itself in harm's way and ultimately saving lives. Um, and certainly the crews of the Steam Runner very much recognised this. It was absolutely beloved for its very durable design, its very heavy armour. They were happy to go into any kind of combat situation because they knew their ships would protect them. They knew the ship would protect them and that they would come out the other end. Didn't matter how dicey or how thick the fighting was, they would get out at the end. So it really is quite an impressive design, very unusual design for Starfleet for something that is quite, really quite brutalist in many respects. It's a very, uh, you know, brute strength, simplistic design. Sometimes the, the simplest solution, sometimes the the dumbest solution is the best solution, and that is the steam runner to a T. Because sometimes you, you've confronted with some kind of problem, whatever it be, be it a hazardous space obstacle, or be it an unrelenting enemy that seeks to destroy your very civilization. You just need a battering ram, a big hunk of solid armor, and just punch through the problem. And that is really where the Steam Runner has no match.